We admit, these questions are designed to test your common sense, but you could also call them trick questions. So, you'll have to pay really close attention and harness your uncommon sense to get the right answer. Think you've got what it takes? Of course. You're driving a bus with 10 people on it. At the first stop, four people get off and two get on. At the next stop, three people get off and five get on. And at the last stop, six people get off and only one gets on. How old is the bus driver? Give me a break. How old is the bus driver? That's a trick question. They're all trick questions. Do you have your answer at home? Old enough to drive a bus? 16, over 16. He is at least 18. He's at least 18. I'm going to say he's an older guy. He's an older guy. About 85. 85. I'm not riding on that right. bus. You're not riding? I think he needs to be retested. All right, I'm going to read the beginning of this yeah. question to you, and then and you're really going to be nice. angry. You're driving a bus. Oh, no. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I don't know about you, but I was lost at like sentence number three on that last video. And, and then I'm like, oh yeah, I just watched this on the first service too. <laughs> you're driving a bus. Hey, my name is Preston Ulmer. I'm the Springfield campus pastor here. So glad that you're here with us today. If you're watching online, glad that you're joining us online. And uh, if you're watching it online, maybe throughout the week, uh, glad that you're watching it on YouTube. Hope you're not driving. But uh, we're going to continue in this series called Mind Your Mind. And today, we're talking about the topic of forgiveness. Forgiveness. And I will say this, if you're like, what does forgiveness have to do with mental health? Well, it has everything to do with mental health. In, in the Old Testament, they had one word that they used, inter the authors would use interchangeably for um, mind and spirit and heart. And so they didn't see it as these separate compartments in who you are. So when we talk about mental health, we're also talking about emotional and spiritual health. I mean, it's all the things. Forgiveness. Forgiveness is a really big deal. So we'll jump into it. I want to tell you a story. If you don't know, uh, I have two daughters. If, if you do know that, you're like, they're always running around in the uh, lobby and uh, stop and say hi to them. But they're, my oldest daughter, her name's Piper. She's nine years old. Their ages are important that you remember, okay? I'm not going to do a riddle. I'm not going to do the thing they did on TV. But you got to remember for this story. Piper's nine years old. Brennan's seven years old. So Piper, nine-year-old, comes up to me and she said, hey, Dad, I would like to watch Marvel movies. Is that okay? Um, and I said, of course it's okay. I didn't look at the rating. I just thought this is a great bonding moment for me and Piper. And I said, of course, let's go talk to your mother. We go talk to her and she's like, no, you can't watch Marvel movies. Those are PG-13. You're nine years old. And I'm like, Lisa. Now, you know, it's not good when you get on the side of your kids and verse each other. But I said, Lisa. I said, I was watching Conan the Barbarian at like, Barbarian, Barbarian, yeah, at like seven or eight years old. And she's like, yeah, but we're not even going to go there. And she said, she goes, I didn't, I wasn't allowed to watch PG-13 movies until I was like closer to 13. And I go, but honey, we want to give our kids a better upbringing than we've ever had, right? <laughs> Long story short, she's like, okay, let's watch it. But we're going to preview each movie before we, you know, let Piper watch it. So we did. And she's watching them, and I'm putting the kids to bed one night. As I'm putting them to bed, if you have kids, you know bedtime is when they're going to tell you their deepest, darkest secrets to try to rope you back in, right? But, so I'm walking out of the room. Good night, girls. And I'm walking out, and I hear Brennan, the seven-year-old, be like, Dad. I'm like, I love you too. You know, you're just trying to get out of the room. Like, please, stay in your room. And she goes, Dad. I go, what? She says, I know the D word. I'm like, oh, Great. There's a lot of D words. So I'm like, okay, which one did she learn? So I said, hey, Brennan, um, why don't you say it in daddy's ear? Tell me where it is. And she goes, okay, come here. And I go, okay. And, I, and she says, dumb, right? Dumb. And I'm like, oh, yeah, we don't say dumb around here. And Piper's like, dumb's not the D word. I'm like, dumb is the D word, Piper. That's the D word. <laughs> we don't call people dumb. Brennan, we don't do that. And if you hear dad do that, you, you can take away my candy. We don't do that. And I'm like, well, it's a different word, but I think you should not call people dumb. And then I'm walking out the door, and Piper's like, hey, Dad. I'm like, yes, honey. She's like, I know the B word. And I'm like, oh, great. We're going to go through the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F. I don't want to make it to F. And so I said, you know the B word. So I walk over, and uh, 
I'm like, okay, tell it to me in my ear. I'm thinking it's going to be butt, bully, I don't know. And she, I, I said, okay, go ahead and tell me. And she tells me the word. I'm like, great. Lisa's right there. I'm like, okay, uh, where'd you learn that at school? She goes, no, I learned it from Thor. Remember when we were watching Thor the other day? And he said, and I'm like, uh, good night. Good night, girls. You need to go to bed. <laughs> so two things. One, yes, I need to ask forgiveness from my wife for letting her watch uh, Thor and all the other movies. It's a little too late, but I'll, I'll do that. Number two, number two is this. It starts early on when we start accumulating the words and the insults and everything it takes. So when it, the point comes that we have to say something to someone that feels good in the moment, but we regret it later, because we're not gonna practice forgiveness, we're gonna practice retaliation and revenge, and right? That starts early. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're seven, nine, 13, you can be younger than that. What the world teaches us is they're gonna hand you a bunch of ammunition and the things that you watch and the things that you hear and the way that you replay things in your mind. It's all to get you for that moment when you need to forgive, but it doesn't feel good to forgive. The thing that feels good is fill in the blank. Insulting. A bunch of other things, by the way. Unforgiveness is really the practice of revenge. It's getting back at someone. And here's why it's really unhealthy mentally, too. Mentally, it, it causes you to get stuck in a loop, and your neurological pathways have a hard time breaking out of that. So you'll keep thinking things like, if only I had done that differently, or if only I had said this, or next time when I see that person, here's what I'm going to say. Oh, I hope they call me again. Oh, I hope that they comment on my Facebook, right? And you get stuck in this loop. Um, studies have shown that if you take someone and you draw their blood five minutes after they tell you a story about someone that they have yet to forgive, there's actually toxins in their blood that their body's released. It's like toxins of anger, fight or flight, we're ready to go. If you talk to someone about forgiveness and someone that they've forgiven, and then you do the same thing, the toxins aren't there anymore. Your body is healthier when you forgive. Now, here's what I know about in a room like this, okay? I'm fully aware when I say the word forgiveness, you are like, I, you don't know what's been done to me. You don't know what's done to me three years ago, last week, 20 years ago. And I would add, I don't know what's going to be done to you tomorrow. I don't know. And that's true. So I may start with a fun story about my daughters learning a word I don't want them to say, but the reality is... Uh, forgiveness is a much harder topic than this. And it's all throughout the Bible, and there's even things like this in the Bible. If we don't forgive, we're not going to be forgiven. It's almost as if our heart, when it hardens, it's unable to receive from above what we're trying to give out. This topic for your spiritual health is foundational. So when I talk about forgiveness, I do want to talk about what it's not first, okay? Because if you're here and you're like, so are you telling me I need to build a bridge of trust with the people who have broken trust and they did this in my life? That's not what I'm saying. So I want to talk about what forgiveness is not, okay? Forgiveness is different than condoning. It's different than condoning. If you have your, your app, your North Point Springfield app, this would be in the message notes. It's different than condoning. Condoning would be that you're giving allowance for something that's morally wrong or something that's offensive. What I'm not saying is that you just go, okay, fine, they're forgiven, and, and what we just let bygones be bygones, right? Sweep it under the rug. That's not what I'm saying. Forgiveness is not condoning, okay? Forgiveness is different than forgetting. It's different. I know a lot of people say, we forgive and we forget. Well, you can't forget, and nor should you sometimes, Okay, if, if someone comes to you and they say, you know, God casts our sins as far as the east is from the west, and it's as if he doesn't even remember um, my sins, and why, why can't you just forget? Uh, maybe you just tell someone, because I'm not God. <laughs> I don't know. Your, your brain will always remember certain things, and sometimes when it's not remembering those certain things, it's not remembering to protect you, but it'll come out later, Okay. And that's trauma, and that's what we talked about in previous weeks. But forgiveness is not forgetting. Like uh, Nintendo, you remember the old school Nintendo, the first Nintendo? Well, I think Super Nintendo might have done this too, but where you had to hit pause and then go to sleep to save your progress, and you had to leave it paused the whole night. Some of you don't remember this. I don't know what they have now, PlayStation 8, 9. I don't know, but 
You know what I'm saying? Like, there was no way to save your progress. And then your brother or sister comes in and they hit the reset button. And you're like, you got to be kidding me. I was right at Bowser and now I got to play. Okay, you know what I'm talking about? Here's the good news and the bad news. <laughs> the good news is your brain's way smarter than a Nintendo. The bad news is there's no reset button. You can't always forget. That's not what forgiveness is. Forgiveness um, is different than reconciliation. The Bible even says this interesting passage where Paul, who's an author in the New Testament, says, in as much as it's possible with you, be reconcilers with all people. In as much as it's possible with you. Sometimes it's not possible, and here's why. Reconciliation is building the bridge between two people. Both people have to be participants in building reconciliation and trust. Forgiveness, only one person has to be a participant. That would be you. Forgiveness is different than reconciliation. And forgiveness is different than justice and consequences. It's different. You can forgive someone and have a restraining order at the same time. I, I know someone in Springfield that last week went to prison, probably going to go to prison for a long time. And uh, the consequence of their actions, that's, that's the consequence. And forgiveness would not mean that they're relieved from that consequence. Forgiveness just means... Hey, the person who's been hurt is now free from the prison of unforgiveness. Forgiveness, when you forgive someone, it is for your benefit. Now, it will benefit the person if there is a relationship and, you're say, and they're saying, I'm sorry, but you know that song, it's too late, or is it too late now to say sorry? I'm like, they may never say sorry. They may never say sorry. And if they don't, you being stuck in resentment and bitterness and unforgiveness is hurting you, and they may not ever be thinking about it. You know, there's an old, um, old quote. I don't even know who said it, but they, they said unforgiveness is like drinking poison and hoping someone else dies. It really is. I mean, it, this is something that is eating away at our soul. So this, when I talk about forgiveness, I'm not talking about these things, okay? Here's what forgiveness is. It's personal. It's always personal. People who say, I'm so mad at the church, I can't forgive the church. I, I, you know, I always wonder, okay, but what face in the church do you need to forgive? You, it's actually impossible, I think, to forgive an entire organization. Maybe you um, had a job and, and you feel like you were done so wrong at your job, and you're like, I'm so mad at my last job. Well, it actually may be a person at your last job. It's a face. Forgiveness is personal. Anytime we interact with people who have forgiven, there's always a story about a person. Now, here's what's great about that. It's not that God just forgave all of mankind, okay? He forgave you. He forgave Preston Ulmer. God forgives you and, you, and you put your name there. It's always personal. Here's the other thing. Forgiveness is a process. It's a process. I was talking to someone earlier who said, it's like I have to forgive. I got to remember to forgive every single time that a bill comes in or that topic comes up. And yeah, it's a process. If you're going, I, I wonder when I'm going to feel like I'm the forgiving person. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, but I do know it's a process. It's a hard process. It's a process. The definition for forgiveness for today, I put it like this. Forgiveness is giving up the hope that the past could be any different and giving up your right for revenge in the future. That's forgiveness. It's probably the only time in church where you hear someone say, give up hope. <laughs> Uh, give up hope that the past could be any different. The past can't change. So thinking to yourself, if only I had, may be helpful for you not to get in that situation again, but it's not going to be helpful for you to change the past. But the future is different. The future, when you, when you forgive someone, the future is different. If we're stuck in this cycle of the past, here's what was done to me, and the future, here's what I'll do to them, we will be stuck in an age-old cycle called revenge. And it's actually bad for our spirits, hardens our heart. We can no longer accept forgiveness from God. But if we accept forgiveness from God, it's like this piggy bank, and it's like God's always depositing forgiveness in us all the time, every day. And if we recognize it and we know it, the value of what we're getting, we're accepting it. And then when it comes time to forgive, we're able to give it out. Um, there's a story in the Bible 
I know if you're a church person, you're probably going, okay, what passage, what Bible passage are we going to go to about forgiveness, right? It's like sprinkled all throughout. Maybe you're thinking Luke 15 hmm, with the prodigal son and the prodigal son, the father forgives. That's a good one. Maybe you're thinking Ephesians before the foundations of the world. Maybe, maybe you're thinking Romans that all of us are sinners and we need the forgiveness of God. All those are good ones, and I thought about them. But we're going to Judges chapter 15, okay? We're going old school, Old Testament. And if you read Judges on a regular basis, you are weird. It's a very violent book. It talks about six judges. First three judges are really like they're epic adventure stories. The latter three ju uh, judges are like epic failure stories. The judge that we're going to talk about is Samson. And I know, you know the story of Samson. I mean, a strong guy. You probably watched it in Branson. And I know when I walked on stage, you're like, is that Samson? I'm not. <laughs> Surprise. But we are going to talk about Samson today. And the story of Samson mirrors, actually, when, when ancient Israelites would read this story or tell this story to each other, it mirrors the story of Israel, God's chosen people in the Old Testament. And it mirrors it like this. Like, Abraham was the father of Israel, of many nations, of God's people, okay, the nation of Israel. And it was in his older age. You know that song, Father Abraham had many sons, many sons had father. Remember that song? Okay, yeah, so uh, there's a reason I'm not a worship leader. And uh, there, it was old dad, old mom, birthing a nation. And then you have Samson's story, old dad, old mom. It's really kind of a miraculous deal in birth Samson. You have the Israelites that they have to live by code. If you read Leviticus, you'll read the code. If you read Deuteronomy, you'll read some of the code. Uh, and then you have Samson. He has to live by the Nazarite vow. Don't touch dead things. Don't cut your hair and don't drink anything from the vine. So no alcohol, no Welch's grapefruit juice, nothing. Okay. And, uh, and you just have these similarities. And the reason I tell you this is this. If you're, when we jump into this passage, if you go, I, I kind of I see myself a little bit in this, right? Hopefully not like a whole lot, okay? This crazy story. But if you're like, I see my tendencies in this. That's how it was meant to be written. That the people reading this would go, oh, that's what unforgiveness does. That's what it does. So the story goes like this. Samson falls in love with a Philistine woman. He's not supposed to, but he does, kind of Romeo and Juliet. And then he has a bachelor party, and at the bachelor party, he gives, the, and the Philistines are present, he gives them all a riddle, and then they can't find the riddle out, and he gives them seven days to find it out, and uh, they can't figure it out, so they ask his wife, and they're like, you're one of us, you're a Philistine, why don't you tell us the answer to this riddle? She tells them, he gets mad, he does what people who tell riddles do when they get mad, he kills 30 of them, okay? Kills 30 people. Then... Chapter 15 starts where he's carrying a goat to his wife, is actually what it says, as you do when you're trying to make up with your spouse, okay? He's carrying a goat to his wife, and he says, um, and then the father, his, his, uh, his father-in-law, okay, says, I was sure that you hated her, um, so I gave her to your companion. All right. Um, well, let me read what else the father said. He said, isn't her younger daughter or your, her younger sister more attractive? Take her instead. So let me just pause. I had a parenting fail. We talked about it. This one is like parenting fail big time, okay? To offer up the other sister because she's more attractive. And just, anyways, all, all stuff. So we jump in right there. And this is what Samson says in verse 3. Samson said to them, this time, this time, I have a right to get even with the Philistines. I will really harm them. So he went out and caught 300 foxes and tied them tail to tail in pairs. He then fastened a torch to every pair of tails. I mean, I don't know if you've done this when you're mad, but it's pretty common. Lit the torches and let the foxes loose in the standing grain of the Philistines. He burned up the shocks and standing grain together with the vineyards and olive groves. I mean, he was mad. Where he got the foxes, I don't know, but he, he was mad, okay? When the Philistines asked, who did this? They were told, Samson, the Timnite's son-in-law, because his wife was given to his companion, which the companion, actually, you can equate to best man, okay? So a little Jerry Springer happening. So given to his best man. So the Philistines went up and burned her and her father to death. Okay, pause. Can you kind of see there's no forgiveness in this story, like ever? It might have started with Samson's parents, actually, no forgiveness towards a different people group. 
but there's no forgiveness. So it's going to be revenge, 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 revenge. Okay, let's keep going. So the Philistines went up and burned. Okay, uh, verse 7. Samson said to them, since you've acted like this, I swear that I won't stop until I get my revenge on you. And it says he attacked them viciously. He killed a few of them. And then verse 10, end of verse 10, says, we have come to take Samson prisoner. They answered, to do to him as he's done to us. Revenge. We're going to do to him what he did to us. He's harmed us. You're like, well, who started this whole thing? I don't know, but, but he, he did it, and we, we're getting back at him. And here's the irony. Um, Samson's already a prisoner. <laughs> unforgiveness, like you just can't be free when you harbor unforgiveness. You can't. Because the only thing you think about is what you're capable of doing, not what God's capable of doing. And uh, so he's already a prisoner. And then uh, at the end of verse 11, he answered, Samson, I merely did to them what they did to me. And it's just back and forth, back and forth. Revenge, revenge, revenge. Where's forgiveness? Um, that's actually the story. If you know the Samson story, it, it ends in devastation. He gets his eyes plucked out. I mean, it's, I told you, if you read this for fun, it's weird. But it's gruesome. And it tells us a lot about what happens when people hold in resentment and unforgiveness. Okay. That what it end, we lose our sight. We actually become prisoners. And in the end, nobody's winning. Nobody's winning. Again, I don't know what you've gone through. It's pretty terrible. All I know is I want you to be free. So the, what we're actually after this morning, it's in your notes, is, is this. We aren't asking how much forgiveness do they deserve. We are asking how much freedom do I desire. That's the key to making sure as we move forward, it's about your freedom, both in Jesus and with people. So if you say, they don't deserve, you don't know how many times they've done this. It's probably true. They don't deserve. But you have been forgiven much, right? Uh, God has deposited in your soul a lot of forgiveness, a lot of forgiveness. Uh, that old game, Pong, I don't know if you remember that, that, where it goes back and forth. You're like, you're going old school, Old Testament, Nintendo, Pong. L look at this. If you've never seen it before, it's just a back and forth game of a ball that's, you got to try to hit the paddle, and, and then it goes back, and then you get, oh, missed it again. And then you just try to hit it back and forth, see how long you can do it, and it's a little addicting. So if you're on your phone right now, don't go to the app store. I bet it's there. But it's a little addicting. And when you read Judges 15, actually, when you read the Bible, actually, well, let's go a little bigger. When you look at human history, it's like a game of Pong. It's like a never-ending game of, you did this to me, I can't forgive you, we won't stop the cycle. Well, and then if you go, let's just go more and more narrow, in your life, it's like a never-ending game. Of, in my life, it's like a never-ending game of Pong, and I just can't stop talking about what will happen when, or they shouldn't have done. So then, if you've decided to follow Jesus, um, it, it, we are empowered by his spirit to forgive, but it's still hard. And one of his disciples asked him this. Um, in Matthew 18, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times. Uh, back then, rabbinical training, the rabbis were taught, you know, forgiveness for three times. and They had reasons why. And so Peter's like, okay, how about I double that and add one? Should I forgive seven times? And Jesus says, um, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Some of your Bibles may say it this way, 70 times 7. What it's not saying, it's not saying on the 78th time, your child can be kicked out of the house, okay? That's not what it's saying. Um, he's just trying to say, you will always need to forgive. You will always need to forgive. In fact, why do we always forgive? Well, it's because God always forgave us. I, don't, I, I have done wrong against God more than 77 times. More than 77 times. And it's not that I wanted to. It's just the reality of who I am and I'm a human. Why we continue to forgive, well, it's because it's not about how much forgiveness they deserve. It's about how much freedom you desire. So now, how do we know we're becoming a forgiving person? That's what I want to jump into. How do we know? Number one. How to become a forgiving person, you're regularly accepting forgiveness from God, not striving to be forgiven. <laughs> uh, it's how, 
how you accept forgiveness from God is actually how you're going to give forgiveness to people. And if you have a view of God that you have to earn forgiveness, then you have a view of people that they have to say, I'm sorry. Maybe for you, um, God is the type of God that you have to say you're sorry for every single sin, right? I learned this at youth group. God, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry that I thought that thought on that day, okay? And he gives me forgiveness for thinking that thought on that day. God, I'm sorry I did this thing on that day, and he gives me forgiveness for doing this thing. I'm like, this is exhausting. This is kind of how I learned about God in youth group. That's an exhausting way to learn about God, isn't it? Let's call that the vending machine God. You put in a confession, he puts out forgiveness, okay? That's the vending machine God. Maybe there's the grandpa God. The grandpa God's like this. When I'm around, I'm going to be on good behavior, um, but then I'm going to kind of like do my own thing, okay? You know, like when, when I send my kids to my grandparents, I'm like, oh, you went to bed on time for them? Oh, you acted not, and they're like, yeah, because they gave me whatever I wanted, you know, those sort of things. So we go back, that's the grandpa God. You're, you're going to God and acting right and doing whatever you think God wants you to do in order to receive forgiveness. Or a step further would be like a perfectionist mindset. We could call it an Enneagram 3 God, but we won't. We'll just call it the perfectionist God. And this would be the type of person who's like, I have to be really, really good so that when I'm really, really bad, he'll give me forgiveness like trying to cover future sins. You know, the problem with all those views is they revolve around you. I show up, I confess every sin, I do this. And you know, forgiveness actually revolves around God. It's who he is, is to love his children, and he gives forgiveness freely to people. And in fact, if we don't learn to accept it regularly, like like a deposit that's being made in our souls, if we don't learn to accept it regularly, what will end up happening is there's no way we're going to give it regularly. And when the moment comes for you to need to forgive someone, you just won't be able to. You'll be like, I don't know what's wrong. Well, it's probably because our hearts are so hardened to the forgiveness from God and we've strived so much and we're not convinced that, uh, that we actually are forgiven by him. Striving's hard. It's very difficult. I, I think, when I think of striving, I think of when I was in Colorado, we used to live in Colorado before Springfield, and when we lived there, we'd have friends that would come in, and they would say, hey, do you want to climb a 14er, which is, you know, a 14-mile mountain, and most of, my, most of the time I'd say, absolutely not, but you can come over for dinner afterwards, okay? I don't, I don't, I, I would have to train and those sort of things, and, and it was just busy time in life. Now it sounds fun, and one time we had a friend come in town, and he said, hey, we're going to do a 14er at Pikes Peak, okay, Colorado Springs area. I'm like, oh, that sounds great. Let me know when you're back into Denver and we'll, we'll get dinner. And he's like, no, you should go with us. And, and they talked to me into it. I said, I don't have time to prep for it. They said, you don't need to prep. That's a lie. But they said, you don't need to prep. And I'm like, okay, well, if I don't need to prep. And if you know my friend John J. Wilson, he actually attends Springfield in uh, the Nixa campus. But uh, John J. is like, I'll be in town and you don't need to prep, Preston. All of the 14ers are the same. All 14ers are not the same, okay? They're not the same. So we start going up and I just remember being like, this, this is like way steeper than I thought it was, right? And I'm looking at the mountain and I'm wondering, oh, and they told me, by the way, they said it should take three to four hours. Three hours, three hours, three hours. I think it took us six to seven and I almost died. So we're climbing up the mountain and I'm so tired. I'm breathing heavy. I'm like, oh, I'm popping Tylenol and protein bars, and I might have eaten leaves. I don't know. I was just disoriented, right? <laughs> and, and I'm so t- exhausted. My body's hurting like it's not hurt before, but I'm not going to be the first one to say something. So I waited until John Jay's like, oh, this is like, this is hard. I'm like, it's hard. This is hard. And, uh, and false summits is when you think you reached the top, but you didn't, and the whole world just laughs at you, and they're like, ha ha, we're not there yet, and there's four or five false summits, so we're, going, we're climbing. All that to say, we get to the, to the, almost to the top, and I'm looking up, it's all rock, it's almost, almost on your hands and knees. I'm going, there's no, my legs, I, I don't think that the neurons in my brain were connecting to the part of my spine that would tell my legs to move, okay? I think it just... So I'm like, John Jay, you can do it, man. You can do it. Both of us are crying. He started crying first. But both of us are in tears. And I'm like, you can do it. You can do it. Just one leg in front of the other. And he would do it. And he'd do this. And then I'd be like, tell me the same thing. Come on, tell me the same thing. And we we finally made it to the top. And then they said, all right, you ready to go back down? Which, duh, 
If you go up a mountain, you got to go down. Now, there are two mountain peaks that you can drive to the top in, uh, in the area out of all 14ers. Pike's Peak was one of them. And so I just, I walked over to the cashier that was, had a little store up top, and I said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask your customers if they'll give me a ride down the mountain. And he's like, do you know them? And I said, no, I don't know them, but then I'm going to ask them because I need a ride. My, I, my legs won't work. And so John Jay's like, I'll go with you. So I'm asking customers, will you give me a ride? No, I won't give you a ride. Okay, okay. Ten bucks, pay him. The next person, will you give me a ride? No, I won't. I, I run into this guy. He's like, yeah, I'll, I, I guess I'll give you a ride. And he's, you know, and whenever he went and talked to his wife, he's like, hey, I got these two hitchhikers. <laughs> and I don't know if they're married, but forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness is a big deal. So we get in the car, and we're just, I'm just like, just take us down the mountain. And this is what they said. They actually said, hey, how do we know you're not going to kill us? <laughs> and I said, I'm too tired to kill you. I couldn't if I tried. What I needed was to accept something that was going to get me there without my effort. Um, your effort to be forgiven by God will never make you forgiven. If you accept the forgiveness that he's deposited in your soul, you're forgiven. And your heart starts to change. And your exhaustion level starts to go down. And your spirit is revitalized. Number two, how do I become a forgiving person? You're convicted of a hopeful future, not confined to a horrible past. The reason I use the word convicted is it's used in two ways. And one's going to hit the head and one's going to hit the heart, okay? Two ways that this def there's a definition. Convicted is like you're like convicted of a crime in the court of law, okay? And so in that sense, that's like logical but then conviction is also a deeply held belief, an emotional belief that you have, that you're unwavering in. And so to, to those of you who are like, okay, but if I stood before God with all of all the stuff in my life, what would he say? I would say he would like say, forgiven, forgiven. He'd ring the forgiven bell and you'd be forgiven. And he'd say, because of what Jesus did for you, you are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. And you're like, no, but I deserve. And he's like, it's not about, no, no, you're you forgiven. And that's to speak here and then here to know like the gospel that you are forgiven, that God loves you deeply. There's nothing you can do that would make him love you more or less than he does right now. In fact, the, the, I don't know when Jesus sat on the cross, it is finished. I don't know what happened in the universe, in the spiritual world and the physical world, but I do know when God said, let there be light, there's light. I do know when God says things, like big things happen, um, you're forgiven. You gotta receive it. Your past may have been horrible, and there may have been stuff that have done, been done to you and things that you have done, but this is where we have to practice forgiveness. There's a reason why your windshield is like 20 times bigger than your rearview mirror. You're not supposed to be driving looking in the back the whole time. We have to move forward. We're convicted of a hopeful future. And then here's the last one. You've accepted forgiveness, and then it's, uh, you're prepared to absorb pain instead of give it. This one's hard. Forgiving someone is very difficult. In fact, it's very painful. When you declare someone is free of the debt and you are no longer thinking about how you're going to um, enact revenge, uh, revenge on them, vengeance on them, and you know that the scripture says, vengeance is mine, declares the Lord. So you're offering up the outcome to God. It doesn't mean that you're condoning. It doesn't mean uh, that you're allowing. It doesn't mean any of those things. But when you do that, it is painful. It's an act of suffering to forgive. This is how Timothy Keller, an author and pastor, put it. He said, you can forgive. Forgiveness means refusing to take them or to make them pay for what they did. However, to refrain from lashing out at someone when you want to do so with all of your being is agony. It is a form of suffering. You are absorbing the debt taking the cost of it completely on yourself instead of taking it out on the other person. And it hurts terribly. Many people would say it feels like a kind of death. Yes, but it is a death that leads to resurrection instead of the lifelong cycle of bitterness and cynicism. You are not giving it any fuel, so the resentment burns lower and lower and lower till it burns out. You're stopping the game of Pong in the world when you forgive. And if you go, but it hurts so bad to forgive. It is part of bearing the cross with Jesus. 
it's actually part of participating in the resurrection as well because it's new life, not old patterns and old ways of thinking. One more passage in Luke that you may have heard shared about money, okay? Luke chapter six. And it says, give and it will be given to you. If, you're, if you've been in church for a while and you're like, oh, this is what people read when they're about to take an offering. And if you're not in church, you're like, that's weird that they read this when they're about to. Um, I wanna read this and then I wanna reframe it for you. Given it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use, it will be measured unto you. Hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> uh, pay $10 and you'll get 10000 more in your lap, pressed down. To, and it's been misused. I mean, that whole mentality has been misused. But that passage has been misused. Let me read you the one sentence before. The sentence before says this. Um, Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, will be poured into your lap. For the measure you use will be measured unto you. It's all about forgiveness. Forgive and you'll be forgiven. It goes both ways. It softens your heart and then forgiveness is, it's poured into your life and you're receiving it and you're giving it all the time. So here's, look, there are people I know in the sound of my voice right now that would say, you don't understand, my spouse cheated on me. And you'd go, I have biblical grounds for divorce. And I'd say, yes, and you also have biblical grounds for forgiveness. Or if you have a business and you're like, the, the, there's a person in our business that didn't just stab me in the back, they took our clients, they took my money, and they took my reputation with them. And I have grounds for doing the same to them. Yes, you also have grounds for forgiveness. Your child that you raised now will roll their eyes when you try to raise them anymore, right? They don't want to, they're still in your house, but they don't want to talk to you. They think they know better than you. They're hiding things in their room. And it's like a battle. And you're like, I have the right to make their life difficult for the next three years. Uh, you also have the right to forgive. Forgiveness, when you're shaken up, shaken up, pressed down, if it's been coming in your life all your life, shaken up, what's going to flow out of you at the moment of like when people need forgiveness? It's just forgiveness. All the forgiveness God's poured into you, this is just going to pour out and it's going to keep coming. Shaken up, pressed down, in your lap, forgiveness is coming. So when someone says, I'm sorry, or they never say, I'm sorry, you're like, I know what it's like to do wrong. It's all that comes out of you. Look, there's no coin shortage. <laughs> or you say, forgiveness? No. I shaken up, pressed down, given it will be given, and you never accept it. Well, what's going to happen is, and everyone's going to wait for when you just explode. You've been bottling up resentment and bitterness for years, and it's going to create a mess, probably because you haven't received the forgiveness that's been given to you, not for years, for your entire life. I want to pray for us, acknowledging that the situations in this room that require forgiveness are really big situations, but also acknowledging the fact we have breath in our lungs and that God wants us on this planet is a really big deal. And he's deposited so much forgiveness into our lives. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for forgiving us of our sins. And, and we do ask the forgiveness would keep coming and flowing into our lives. Help us to receive that by the power of your spirit. Help us also to forgive those who have come against us. That what you've deposited in us for our entire lives would be flowing out of us, not what the world has given us, but what you've given us, so that we can stop this endless cycle and we can participate in the resurrection of Jesus, that all things are made new, even relationships. In Jesus' name, amen.